I'm so excited to first be able to introduce to you um, doc Dr. Xu Jin Peng. And I apologize, I've tried my best to practice that. Um, you can also call him JP Xu. Um, and JP obtained his BSc specializing in agronomy from Jingzhou Art Agricultural University, uh, um, MSc specializing in agricultural microbiology from Nanjing Agricultural University, and a PhD specializing in fungal genetics from the University of Toronto. After 3.5 years of postdoctoral research training specialized in population biology of human fungal pathogens at Duke University, JP joined the Department of Biology at McMaster University as a tenure track assistant professor in 2000 and was promoted to full professor in 2012. His current research examines the genetics and population biology of several groups of fungi, including wild mushrooms, plant fungal pathogens, and human and animal fungal pathogens. So thank you very much. I'm excited to learn from you, JP. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. And thank you for RCI for organizing this event. I also want to welcome everybody to this forum. It's very um, heartwarming to have so many people who are interested in fungi. Quite often uh, when I'm teaching over here at the Mac, I'm only interacting with the people in my lab who are interested in fungi, plus a few other uh, stranglers. So I'm tasked with introducing some basic information about the mushrooms. So I have here mushrooms good, mushrooms bad, and the bad ones I, from my mind are also the ugly ones. Um, how do I go forward with this? Can I please forward? So as Amanda pointed out, there are estimated 2.8 to 3.5 million species. But over the last 10 years or so, many different estimates have, uh, have been made about the number of fungal species in the world. And that range from 700,000 to over 5 million. And these estimates differ because of the different assumptions and also differ because of the species concepts that are used by different people. So out of those estimated species, about 150,000 have been named and described in the literature. So among those, about 10,000 are fleshy mushrooms. Those are the ones that can form floating bodies that we can see from the naked eye. And there's a lot of tissue that we could touch and do whatever we want with them. And about 140,000 are microscopic, that includes many of the molds and the yeasts. So out of the 10,000 that are fresh mushrooms, about 50% of them are too tough to chew and are not really digestible. And another quarter, 25%, they're edible, but they don't really have much flavor and don't really have much cooking or edible quality. And then we have about 44% that are very tasty and nutritious. And those are the ones that typically go out and collect at this time of the year, for example. Now, it depends on where you live, uh, the different mushroom picking seasons. And then we have about 20% that can cause irritations to our digestive system. They usually would not cause death, but cause irritations. And those may differ among different people, just like each of us are susceptible to different things in allergens and other things. It's the same for many of the mushrooms, that some of them can cause severe problems to some people, but may not cause any problem to others. However, about 1% of the total, that's about 100 species, they are highly poisonous, regardless of um, where you come from what's your background, what's your age, what's your gender. Now, out of the 140,000 microscopic fungi, about 20,000 are plant fungal pathogens. So here, I'm just showing a few pictures. Amanda already mentioned a couple. These are some of those really deadly fungal diseases that impact uh, farmers and forests. The first one is Puccinia triticea 
that causes leaf rust, that again each year causes billions of dollars of loss. The corn smart caused by the fungus Eustilago maidis. Over here, you have the rice blast caused by the fungus Macaniposi grisii. And then we have here the chestnut, chestnut blight that basically has wiped out the chestnut trees in eastern North America. And this one is Ophiostoma fungus that causes the Dutch elm disease. Dutch elm trees used to line up the North American streets in the 60s and 70s, and now they're practically all gone. So each of those cost damages in the billions of dollars. For the wheat, corn, and rice, as well as other crop fungal diseases, the estimated damage is about several, several billions, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars each year to farmers. Now for mushrooms, they can be classified into many different categories based on their phylogenetic affiliation or based on their ecological niche or substrate. So here is a brief classification based on their ecological, their lifestyle. So they are classified into broad categories of saprophytes, animal associated mushrooms, and plant associated like mycorrhizal mushrooms. The examples of saprophytic mushrooms, those are the ones that grow on dead organic matter, include the butter mushroom, those are the ones that we typically buy in the, in the supermarkets. They shown over here, this is what they look like in a mushroom farm. They also include shiitake, oyster, etc. And this group of mushrooms are typically the easiest one to domesticate because of the substrate requirement is pretty well known. The second group are the animal associated. Some of those examples that people may encounter uh, are in the health food stores, the cordyceps. And I think Amanda alluded to this group as ugly, that they can control some of the insect behavior. But some of those animal associated also is a food source for animals. For example, the tomatomyces shown over here on the right. This is one of the species and it's associated with termite mounds. And the termites use the mycelium of this fungi as food, as a food source. And when they form floating body, uh, we pick them as food for ourselves. And they're yummy, very yummy. The third group is also the largest group of macroscopic fungi, I believe, are very similar to some of the saprophytes. But they play very essential roles for plant nutrition, plant defense against pathogens, and those form symbiotic relationships with plant roots. And the example over here on the right is a russula, very bright red, and they're treasured in some of the cultures, indigenous cultures. So I'm going to show a few examples that are really choice mushrooms uh, for pretty much all over the world and are relatively easy to identify and pick and are safe to eat as well. So the first example I brought up over here is the golden chanterelle. And they have this very typical coloration and structure. Recently, we went to uh, Newfoundland, my wife and I and uh, our, my, my in-laws. And in Newfoundland, we had a feast around the North Bay, the North Point in Grossmont uh, National Park, where we harvested quite a lot of the chanterelle. And you can see we had a feast this being a big part. So this is a relatively easy to identify and choice mushroom. The second one, which is also very common in the Northern Hemisphere, is Kim Bullet, um, Bolit, Bolitus agilis, species complex. And it can be very big. It's called a Kim Bolit, not uh, for, any, for a good reason. They're very big, as you can see on the right, a few pieces could fill up, fill up the whole um, frying pan. And again, they're very delicious. Another common one in the pine forest is this mushroom, Matsutake. 
and this is found across the Northern Hemisphere, Tricholoma mastaki species complex. They are very highly prized, prized uh, in Japan, in the Japanese culture, which can be sold up to thousands of dollars for per kilogram of fresh floating body. Basically, about a dozen of this mushroom can be sold uh, that much. But typically, it's about four to five hundred US dollars per kilogram. As you can see over here, especially uh, common in the fall season. And for this little mushroom, we have it, we have the close related species in North America. In Eastern North America, it's called the Magnivalari. In Western North America, it's called uh, Tricholoma morianum. And in Mexico, there's a Mesoamericanum. And the, the wild Matsutake collected from different parts of the world are priced differently. And that potentially causes counterfeiting. And we have identified the evidence of counterfeiting, geographic counterfeiting of this mushroom. And in the fall, like uh, has been alluded to, it's a very good season for mushroom hunting. And this is one of the common mushrooms that we see around Hamilton. This is the chicken of the woods, different from hen of the woods, which is not as bright colored, but as delicious. So this is my lab from a couple of years ago when we went to South Coots, uh, just close to McMaster campus, harvested the, this mushrooms from one single log and we still have quite a lot left over. And each of this is enough for making a couple of dishes for several meals. And of course, this fall, I have seen quite a few giant puffballs. This is one in, our, in one of our neighbor's backyard. Now this is one is a bit old. Uh, when it's fresh, relatively fresh, it's a very, very solid round ball that if you harvest and cook it, it could be several meals worth of uh, delicious food. So those are the good ones um, based on taste buds. But the mushrooms can also cause deadly consequences. So throughout the history, there's been a report of mushroom poisoning. Shown here is a couple of prominent examples that have been uh, inferred based on historical text including the Buddha likely being killed by mushroom poisoning over 2,500 uh, 2, years ago, the death cap Amanita phalloides causing the death of multiple prominent figures in the European history. And there are many species in the genus Amanita that are very deadly. So shown here are three of the most common ones distributed in different parts of the world. On the left over here is one that's most common in Europe, Amanita pantherina. In the middle over here is the most common one in Southern Ontario around the Great Lakes, Amanita vesporigera, called the destroying angel. And on the right over here, Amanita exitialis. This was only described about 10 years ago, but has been linked with about 100 deaths over that time span, and it's still reported to cause deaths um, this year. And this one is primarily found in, as I mentioned, Southeast Asia and Southern China. So those Amanita fungi are typically relatively easy to identify because of their unique structure, the bulbous at the bottom, a whale, and the unique cap, identifiable cap structure. But there are many other poisonous mushrooms that are not easily identifiable based on morphological features. And shown here are some of those that can be easily confused with some of the non-poisonous ones. So we have the Rusula subnigracans, Gararia, South, uh, South Sea Seps, and the Chlorophyllum over here at the bottom. They are 
easily confused with some of the non-poisonous and in some of the edible ones. So these mushrooms, we know that they are poisonous. They can cause death. But there's still some of them that we don't know. There's still quite a large number of mushrooms that have not been described, and some of them might be poisonous. So this is my last slide. This one shows a little white mushroom. Up until about 10 years ago, it's not known in the literature at all. It's not described. But over the last several decades, there's been a report of sudden unexplained death syndrome in southwestern China. And it, those people die because, uh, suddenly, and most of them are very healthy young people, had no prior disease symptoms. They just suddenly dropped dead. And the primary happens in the summer. So there was a lot of investigative work going in there. And finally, investigators suspected that this mushroom, this little white mushroom, might be the cause. And later on, it was found that it contained toxins that can cause cardiac arrest. OK, I'm going to stop here. As I have shown that mushrooms are beautiful to look at. Some of them are delicious to eat, but many of them, some of them are very deadly. And if you're not sure, just enjoy looking at them, but not <laughs> eating them. Perfect. I think that is such a wonderful take home. Um, those are some really famous deaths that I didn't know of that were um, caused by fungi. So very important to keep in mind.